Chapter 3 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 3 The Power of the Word. By thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. A person knowing the power of the word becomes very careful of his conversation. He has only to watch the reaction of his words to know that they do not return void. Through his spoken word man is continually making laws for himself. I knew a man who said, I always miss a car. It invariably pulls out just as I arrive. His daughter said, I always catch a car. It's sure to come just as I get there. This occurred for years. Each had made a separate law for himself, one of failure, one of success. This is the psychology of superstitions. The horseshoe, or rabbit's foot, contains no power, but man's spoken word and belief that it will bring him good luck creates expectancy in the subconscious mind and attracts a lucky situation. I find, however, this will not work when a man has advanced spiritually and knows a higher law. One cannot turn back, and one must put away graven images. For example, two men in my class had had great success in business for several months, when suddenly everything went to smash. We tried to analyze the situation, and I found, instead of making their affirmations and looking to God for success and prosperity, they had each bought a lucky monkey. And I said, Oh, I see, you have been trusting in the lucky monkeys instead of God. Put away the lucky monkeys and call on the law of forgiveness, for man has power to forgive or neutralize his mistakes. They decided to throw the lucky monkeys down a coal hole, and all went well again. This does not mean, however, that one should throw away every lucky ornament or horseshoe about the house, but he must recognize that the power back of it is the one and only power, God, and that the object simply gives him a feeling of expectancy. I was with a friend one day who was in deep despair. In crossing the street, she picked up a horseshoe. Immediately, she was filled with joy and hope. She said God had sent her the horseshoe in order to keep up her courage. It was indeed, at that moment, about the only thing that could have registered in her consciousness. Her hope became faith, and she ultimately made a wonderful demonstration. I wish to make the point clear that the men previously mentioned they were depending on the monkeys alone, while this woman recognized the power back of the horseshoe. I know in my own case it took a long while to get out of a belief that a certain thing brought disappointment. If the thing happened, disappointment invariably followed. I found the only way I could make a change in the subconscious was by asserting there are not two powers, there is only one power, God. Therefore, there are no disappointments, and this means a happy surprise. I noticed a change at once, and happy surprises commenced coming my way. I have a friend who said nothing could induce her to walk under a ladder. I said, if you are afraid, you are giving into a belief in two powers, good and evil, instead of one. As God is absolute, there can be no opposing power, unless man makes the false of evil for himself. To show you believe in only one power, God, and that there is no power or reality in evil, walk under the next ladder you see. Soon after, she went to her bank. She wished to open her box in the safety deposit vault, and there stood a ladder on her pathway. It was impossible to reach the box without passing under the ladder. She quailed with fear and turned back. She could not face the lion on her pathway. However, when she reached the street, 
my words rang in her ears, and she decided to turn and walk under it. It was a big moment in her life, for ladders had held her in bondage for years. She retraced her steps to the vault, and the ladder was no longer there. This so often happens. If one is willing to do a thing that he is afraid to do, he does not have to. It is the law of non-resistance, which is so little understood. Someone has said that courage contains genius and magic. Face a situation fearlessly, and there is no situation to face. It falls away of its own weight. The explanation is that fear attracted the ladder on the woman's pathway, and fearlessness removed it. Thus, the invisible forces are ever working for the man who is always pulling the strings himself, though he does not know it. Owing to the vibratory power of words, whatever man voices, he begins to attract. People who continually speak of disease invariably attract it. After man knows the truth, he cannot be too careful of his words. For example, I have a friend who often says on the phone, Do come to see me and have a fine old-fashioned chat. This old-fashioned chat means an hour of about 500 to 1,000 destructive words, the principal topics being loss, lack, failure, and sickness. I reply, no, thank you. I've had enough old-fashioned chats in my life. They are too expensive, but I will be glad to have a new-fashioned chat and talk about what we want, not what we don't want. There is an old saying that man only dares to use his words for three purposes, to heal, bless, or prosper. What man says of others will be said of him, and what he wishes for another he is wishing for himself. Curses like chickens come home to roost. If a man wishes someone bad luck, he is sure to attract bad luck himself. If he wishes to aid someone to success, he is wishing and aiding himself to success. The body may be renewed and transformed through the spoken word and clear vision, and disease be completely wiped out of the consciousness. The metaphysician knows that all disease has a mental correspondence, and in order to heal the body, one must first heal the soul. The soul is the subconscious mind, and it must be saved from wrong thinking. In the 23rd Psalm we read, he restoreth my soul. This means that the subconscious mind or soul must be restored with the right ideas, and the mystical marriage is the marriage of the soul and the spirit, or the subconscious and superconscious mind. They must be one. When the subconscious is flooded with the perfect ideas of the superconscious, God and man are one. I and the Father are one. That is, he is one with the realm of perfect ideas. He is the man made in God's likeness and image, imagination, and is given power and dominion over all created things, his mind, body, and affairs. It is safe to say that all sickness and unhappiness come from the violation of the law of love. A new commandment I give unto you, love one another. And in the game of life, love or good will, takes every trick. For example, a woman I know had, for years, an appearance of a terrible skin disease. The doctors told her it was incurable, and she was in despair. She was on the stage, and she feared she would soon have to give up her profession, and she had no other means of support. She, however, procured a good engagement, and on the opening night made a great hit. She received flattering notices from the critics and was joyful and elated. The next day she received a notice of dismissal. A man in the cast had been jealous of her success and had caused her to be sent away. She felt hatred and resentment taking complete possession of her and she cried out, Oh God, don't let me hate that man. That night she worked for hours in the silence. She said, 
i soon came into a very deep silence i seemed to be at peace with myself with the man and with the whole world i continued this for two following nights and on the third day i found i was healed completely of the skin disease in asking for love or goodwill she had fulfilled the law for love is the fulfilling of the law and the disease which came from the subconscious resentment was wiped out continual criticism produces rheumatism as critical inharmonious thoughts cause unnatural deposits in the blood which settle in the joints false growths are caused by jealousy hatred unforgiveness fear etc every disease is caused by a mind not at ease i said once in my class there is no use asking any one what's the matter with you we might as well just say who's the matter with you unforgiveness is the most prolific cause of disease it will harden arteries or liver and affect the eyesight in its train are endless ills i called on a woman one day who said she was ill from having eaten a poisoned oyster i replied oh no the oyster was harmless you poisoned the oyster what's the matter with you she answered oh about nineteen people she had quarrelled with nineteen people and had become so inharmonious that she attracted the wrong oyster any inharmony on the external indicates there is mental inharmony as the within so the without man's only enemies are within himself and a man's foes shall be they of his own household personality is one of the last enemies to be overcome as this planet is taking its initiation in love it was christ's message peace on earth good will toward man the enlightened man therefore endeavors to perfect himself upon his neighbor his work is within himself to send out good will and blessings to every man and the marvelous thing is that if one blesses a man he has no power to harm him for example a man came to me asking him to treat for success in business he was selling machinery and a rival appeared on the scene with what he proclaimed was a better machine and my friend feared defeat i said first of all we must wipe out all fear and know that god protects your interests and that the divine idea must come out of the situation that is the right machine will be sold by the right man to the right man and i added don't hold one critical thought toward that man bless him all day and be willing not to sell your machine if it isn't the divine idea so he went to the meeting fearless and non-resistant and blessing the other man he said the outcome was very remarkable the other man's machine refused to work and he sold his without the slightest difficulty but i say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and pray for them which spitefully use you and persecute you good will produces a great aura of protection about the one who sends it and no weapon that is formed against him shall prosper in other words love and good will destroy the enemies within oneself therefore one has no enemies on the external there is peace on earth for him who sends good will to man end of chapter three recording by amy conger chapter four of the game of life and how to play it this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin Chapter 4 The Law of Non-Resistance Resist not evil. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Nothing on earth can resist an absolutely non-resistant person. The Chinese say that water is the most powerful element because it is perfectly non-resistant. It can wear away a rock and sleep away all before it. Jesus Christ said, "Resist not evil," for he knew in reality there is no evil. Therefore, nothing to resist. Evil has come of man's vain imagination or a belief in two powers, good and evil. There is an old legend. That Adam and Eve ate of Maya, the tree of illusion, and saw two powers instead of one power, God. Therefore, evil is a false law man has made for himself through psychoma or soul sleep. Soul sleep means that man's soul has been hypnotized by the race belief of sin, sickness, and death, etc., which is carnal or mortal thought. And his affairs have outpictured his illusions. We have read in a preceding chapter that man's soul is his subconscious mind, and whatever he feels deeply, good or bad, is outpictured by that faithful servant. His body and affairs show forth what he has been picturing. The sick man has pictured sickness; the poor man, poverty. The rich man, wealth. Young people often say, "Why does a little child attract illness when it is too young to even know what it means?" I answer that children are sensitive and receptive to the thoughts of others about them, and often outpicture the fears of their parents. I heard a metaphysician once say, "If you do not run your subconscious mind yourself, someone else will run it for you." Mothers often, unconsciously, attract illness and disaster to their children by continually holding them in thoughts of fear and watching for symptoms. For example, a friend asked a woman if her little girl had had the measles. She replied promptly, "Not yet." This implied that she was expecting the illness and therefore preparing the way for what she did not want for herself and child. However, the man who is centered and established in his right thinking, the man who sends out only goodwill to his fellow man, and who is without fear, cannot be touched or influenced by the negative thoughts of others. In fact, he could then receive only good thoughts, as he himself sends forth only good thoughts. Resistance is hell, for it places man in a state of torment. A metaphysician once gave me a wonderful recipe for taking every trick in the game of life. It is the acme of non-resistance. He gave it in this way: At one time in my life, I baptized children, and of course, they had many names. Now I no longer baptize children, but I baptize events. But I give every event the same name. If I have a failure, I baptize it success, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In this, we see the great law of transmutation, founded on non-resistance. Through his spoken word, every failure was transmuted into success. For example, a woman who required money, who knew the spiritual law of opulence, was thrown continually in a business way with a man who made her feel very poor. He talked lack and limitation, and she commenced to catch his poverty thoughts. So she disliked him, and blamed him for her failure. She knew, in order to demonstrate her supply, she must first feel that she had received. A feeling of opulence must precede its manifestation. It dawned upon her one day that she was resisting the situation and seeing two powers instead of one. So she blessed the man and baptized the situation. Success, she affirmed. As there is only one power, God, this man is here for my good and my prosperity. Just what he did not seem to be there for. Soon after that, she met through this man a woman who gave her, for a service rendered, several thousand dollars, and the man moved to a distant city, and faded harmoniously from her life. 
make the statement, Every man is a golden link in the chain of my good, for all men are God in manifestation, awaiting the opportunity given by man himself to serve the divine plan of his life. Bless your enemy, and you rob him of his ammunition. His arrows will be transmuted into blessings. This law is true of nations as well as individuals. Bless a nation, send love and goodwill to every inhabitant, and it is robbed of its power to harm. Man can only get the right idea of non-resistance through spiritual understanding. My students have often said, I don't want to be a doormat. I reply, when you use non-resistance with wisdom, no one will ever be able to walk over you. Another example. One day I was impatiently awaiting an important telephone call. I resisted every call that came in and made no outgoing calls myself, reasoning that it might interfere with the one I was awaiting. Instead of saying, Divine ideas never conflict, the call will come at the right time, leaving it to infinite intelligence to arrange, I commenced to manage things myself. I made the battle mine, not God's, and remained tense and anxious. The bell did not ring for about an hour, and I glanced at the phone and found the receiver had been off that length of time, and the phone was disconnected. My anxiety, fear, and belief in interference had brought on a total eclipse of the telephone. Realizing what I had done, I commenced blessing the situation at once. I baptized it success and affirmed, I cannot lose any call that belongs to me by divine right. I am under grace and not under law. A friend rushed out to the nearest telephone to notify the company to reconnect. She entered a crowded grocery, but the proprietor left his customers and attended to the call himself. My phone was connected at once, and two minutes later I received a very important call, and about an hour afterward, the one I had been awaiting. One's ships come in over a calm sea. So long as man resists a situation, he will have it with him. If he runs away from it, it will run after him. For example, I repeated this to a woman one day, and she replied, How true that is! I was unhappy at home. I disliked my mother, who was critical and domineering. So I ran away and was married. But I married my mother, for my husband was exactly like my mother, and I had the same situation to face again. Agree with thine adversary quickly. That means, agree that the adverse situation is good. Be undisturbed by it, and it falls away of its own weight. None of these things move me is a wonderful affirmation. The inharmonious situation comes from some inharmony within man himself. When there is in him no emotional response to an inharmonious situation, it fades away forever from his pathway. So we see man's work is ever with himself. People have said to me, Give treatments to change my husband or my brother. I reply, No, I will give treatments to change you. When you change, your husband and your brother will change. One of my students was in the habit of lying. I told her it was a failure method, and if she lied, she would be lied to. She replied, I don't care. I can't possibly get along without lying. One day she was speaking on the phone to a man with whom she was very much in love. She turned to me and said, I don't trust him. I know he's lying to me. I replied, well, you lie yourself, so someone has to lie to you, and you will be sure it will be just the person you want the truth of. Sometime after that I saw her and she said, I'm cured of lying. I questioned, What cured you? She replied, I've been living with a woman who lied worse than I did. One is often cured of his faults by seeing them in others. Life is a mirror, and we find only ourselves reflected in our associates. Living in the past is a failure method and a violation of spiritual law. Jesus Christ said, Behold, now is the accepted time. 
Now is the day of salvation. Lot's wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. The robbers of time are the past and the future. Man should bless the past and forget it, if it keeps him in bondage, and bless the future, knowing it has in store for him endless joys. But live fully in the now. For example, a woman came to me complaining that she had no money with which to buy Christmas gifts. She said, last year was so different. I had plenty of money and gave lovely presents. And this year, I scarcely have a cent. I replied, you will never demonstrate money while you are pathetic and live in the past. Live fully in the now and get ready to give Christmas presents. Dig your ditches and the money will come. She exclaimed, I know what to do. I'll buy some tinsel, twine, Christmas seals, and wrapping paper. I replied, do that, and the presents will come and stick themselves to the Christmas seals. This, too, was showing financial fearlessness and faith in God, as the reasoning mind said, keep every cent you have, as you are not sure you will get any more. She bought her seals, paper, and twine, and a few days before Christmas received a gift of several hundred dollars. Buying the seals and twine had impressed the subconscious with expectancy and opened the way for the manifestation of the money. She purchased all the presents in plenty of time. Man must live suspended in the moment. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation of the dawn. He must be spiritually alert, ever waiting his leads, taking advantage of every opportunity. One day I said continually, silently, Infinite spirit, don't let me miss a trick. And something very important was told to me that evening. It is most necessary to begin the day with the right words. Make an affirmation immediately upon waking. For example, Thy will be done this day. Today is a day of completion. I give thanks for this perfect day. Miracle shall follow miracle, and wonders shall never cease. Make this a habit, and one will see wonders and miracles come into his life. One morning I picked up a book and read, Look with wonder at that which is before you. It seemed to be my message for the day, so I repeated it again and again. Look with wonder at that which is before you. At about noon, a large sum of money was given to me, which I had been desiring for a certain purpose. In the following chapter, I will give affirmations that I have found most effective. However, one should never use an affirmation unless it is absolutely satisfying and convincing to his own consciousness. And often, an affirmative is changed to suit different people. For example, the following has brought success to many. I have a wonderful work in a wonderful way. I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. I gave the first two lines to one of my students, and she added the last two. It made a most powerful statement, as there should always be perfect payment for perfect service, and a rhyme sinks easily into the subconscious. She went about singing it aloud, and soon did receive wonderful work in a wonderful way, and gave wonderful service for wonderful pay. Another student, a businessman, took it and changed the word to business. He repeated, I have a wonderful business in a wonderful way, and I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. That afternoon, he made a $41,000 deal, though there had been no activity in his affairs for months. Every affirmation must be carefully worded and completely cover the ground. For example, I knew a woman who was in great need and made a demand for work. She received a great deal of work, but was never paid anything. She now knows to add, wonderful service for wonderful pay. It is man's divine right to have plenty, more than enough. His barns should be full, and his cup should flow over. This is God's idea for man, and when man breaks down the barriers of lack in his own consciousness, the golden age will be his, and every righteous desire of his heart 
fulfilled. End of chapter 4. Recording by Amy Conger. Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.